Well, I'm sitting here and I'm just speechless uh, because this, I'll read it to you. Dan Tennis, Novak Djokovic is the only player to beat Nadal at Roland Garros twice. That's right. It never happened before. Soderling beat him once. Djokovic beat him once. Now Djokovic has beat Rafa, the king of clay, in his sandbox twice. Massive. Uh, And... It's even more important than that because, you know, forget about the GOAT implications, right? If, if Djokovic can win on Sunday, then he has a shot at Wimbledon to make this a three-way tie, all three of the greatest of all time players. And I've always wanted to see them tied in a three-way. That's been some, I always used to uh, say that it would be great if they all finished with 23 majors apiece at a tie so people could debate and argue over who's the best and they all get uh, the respect they deserve in the end. And it's Michael Jordan's uh, jersey number, number 23. That would have been perfect, right? But just to see them tied, even if it's at 20, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. But before we talk about that, let's look at this. Uh, I always uh, seem to remember Nadal losing the Soderling as he was injured. So I looked it up. Here's uh, an answer on Qora website, and I I think it checks out pretty good to me. Uh, Elise Scott, former junior and college-level tennis player, wrote this in May May 31st, 2019. The uh, question was, did Rafa have an injury when he was playing Soderling? I think so. Nadal has chronic patellar, and I've been reading Rafa's book. I should have finished it by now, but I've been uh, I've been busy with other things. But I, I read at least half of it, and he talks about this condition in his book that Elise is going to talk about here. So I can back that up. Nadal has chronic patellar tendinitis, which comes and goes. It takes six to eight weeks to subside. He also wears a special orthotic in his shoes to cushion a bone, this is what I'm talking about from the book, that did not calcify properly. This is a serious issue. They thought when Rafa was much younger that he wouldn't be able to uh, continue to play. It was a congenital problem that was diagnosed in 2005. That's correct. Uh, 2005, they, they thought there was a period where Rafa was very depressed, the book talks about how his dad, you know, was really like his rock and helped him get through that period where Rafa thought it might be over. Such a bright start for him as a professional tennis player, and he might have to stop is what they were worried about back then. So it's a pretty serious um, congenital problem. This peculiar angle of the orthotics in his custom-built shoe, while it saves his navicular, na- navicular, I don't know what that is. It's a bone in his foot, with smart angling. It transfers more stress on the tendons in his left knee, hence the uh, the early knee problems. You know, someone who works out like Rafa and builds up the leg muscles like him, I mean, show me those calves, uh, as Grigor Dimitrov would say, they typically don't have a lot of knee injuries because the leg is so strong it can take a lot, of build, uh, a lot of a beating. So this is a special thing here. I recently rewatched his match with Soderling. No question, Soderling played out of his mind, Rosal also in Wimbledon. When you see a top player lose, it's usually a combination of them being slightly off and the other player playing extremely high risk, which is true. That's what happened in 09. Soderling was teeing off on every shot, and Nadal was a half step slow. Less than three weeks later, Nadal pulled out of Wimbledon, citing tendonitis in his knees. You better believe, he said, he said the pain worsened in his Madrid final loss to Fed before the French Open. Rafa was Wimbledon defending champion, of course, in 09, having beaten Federer in the Epic of 08. There's no way he would not have tried to defend his title if he could have. So, yes, he wasn't 100% when he lost to Soderling. Still an amazing accomplishment from Robin Soderling. Uh, Let's check it out with Wikipedia to get a second source on this. Was Rafa injured the first time he lost on clay? Is it a, a proper loss, I guess you could say? Or at least, you know, when we're looking at the whole body of work that is Rafa's career at the French Open... How uh, heavily do we weight this? By beating Leighton Hewitt in the third round of the French, Nadal set a record 31 consecutive wins at the French Open, beating the previous record of 28 by Borg. This run came to an end when he lost to eventual runner-up Robin Soderling in the fourth round. Nadal's first, and until 2015, only loss to the French Open. After a surprise defeat in France, Nadal withdrew from the um, that's Queen's Club. Aegon was their sponsor then. Uh, It was confirmed that he was suffering from tendonitis in both of his knees. Confirmed, baby. So, great win for Robin Soderling, but it's not like the win today from Novak Djokovic. Now, let's talk about when Djokovic did it last time, 2015, because I always felt like Rafa wasn't 100% in that loss as well. And I know some people out there are already saying, Matt, Matt, Rafa looked like he might have been injured at the end of today's match. Well, I think... 
Look, Rafa looked really good coming in here. I thought he was going to win. The whole world thought he was going to win. He was up 5-0 in the first set. This is a very different match. 2015, Rafa got crunched because he wasn't 100%. When Rafa's ankle was giving him problems later, I think that's because Djokovic was playing so well. That's how much wear and tear he was putting on Rafa mid-match. He took a healthy Rafa and banged him up by the end of the match. That is, that's incredible. So notice what 2014 says. Ninth French Open title and injuries. 2014, a bunch of injuries. Let's take it with 2015 continued struggles and rankings drop. These were bad years for Rafa, if you can remember. Fed fans like myself might not have noticed so much because Roger was having a little renaissance uh, in 2014 and 2015, even though Djokovic would beat him in every final he made in the majors uh, both of those years, uh, both of those Wimbledon finals. The Fed fans will remember very well when Djokovic, uh, especially 2014, that was the better one, I believe. 2015 was the four-set final, five sets in 2014. Anyways, let's read this. Nadal began the year, 2015, as defending champ of Qatar, the Qatar Open. But he suffered a shocking three-set loss to Michael Barrera in the first round. He won the doubles title of Monaco at the Aussie Open. He lost in straight sets to Tomas Birdman, Burdich, in the quarterfinal, ending a 17-match winning streak against the Birdman. So that'll tell you something. Rafa's not healthy when he's losing to the Birdman. Uh, February, Nadal loses in the semifinals to Fabio Fonini in uh, Brazil. I remember that one well. Before going on to win his 46th career clay court title against Juan Monaco in Argentina. Argentina. Nadal then participated at Indian Wells in Miami, but suffered early defeats to Milos and Verdasco. Yeah, not healthy. Quarterfinals and third round, respectively. Nadal then began... Uh, participating uh, his his clay season at Monte Carlo. Reached the semifinals, lost to Djokovic, got smacked. After losing the Fonini again in Barcelona, he enters Madrid. Two-time defending champion, loses to freaking Andy Murray. Yeah, not healthy, not 100%. Resulting in his dropping out of the top five for the first time since 2005. He then loses in the quarterfinals of Rome to Stan. Loses to Djokovic in the quarters of the French, and again, he got smacked down. It was so bad that, take a look, this was an article... This was an article from back then. This is what the end looks like for Rafa Nadal. SBNation.com. Well, screw you, bozos, because it wasn't the end. And I don't think this is the end yet, but we got to say this is the biggest accomplishment uh, for Djokovic in his career, maybe. It's right up there because this is something, you know, Roger doesn't have a win over Rafa. But if Rafa just finished his career by beating Djokovic every time they played at the French Open, you could always look at those things I just told you. Well, Soderling got a little lucky because Rafa wasn't 100%. Djokovic, same thing. Everyone, it was the World Tour 2015 of Rafa getting beat by everybody on clay. All kinds of people, including the Joker in three sets. I think it was 7 5, 6 3, 6 1. It was like a beat down. So that takes us here. On Keat, we're going to retweet or we're going to retweet from On Keat. Haven't seen him in a while. Uh, it's been uh, a few years, I think. Believe it or not, Coffee Break Tennis is almost five years old now. So, or four years, excuse me. Now I expect the Joker to get the 20, this Wimbledon, by defeating... Well, first off, he's giving him... Don't forget about this guy. Sitsipas is just a small kid who doesn't know how to fight, but he's now in a Grand Slam final. This is great. We'll give it a heart. We'll give it a heart over ATP WTA memes on the Instagram. But back to the tweet of Ann Keat, which is a pretty sweet tweet. I may say if I'm not being discreet. So now I expect the Joker to get the... What the heck, Matt? I expect the Joker to get the 20 this Wimbledon by defeating Roger in the semis, more probably uh, before the final. Well, hopefully somehow the seed works out. It will be saying, we'll be singing thank you, Mr. Wimbledon, and if we can get Roger and Djokovic in opposite halves of the draw, that's what we need. Uh, as a Fed fan, I guess it's time to acknowledge that the Joker will very soon be the GOAT statistically. That's, uh, that's, that's very true. He very well. We could have our three-way tie. He could win the U.S. Open, even though it's been a while. Struggles at the U.S. Open. Uh, Not even mentioning what happened last year. But he could be the all-time great in the Grand Slam race with 21 leaving Rafa and Roger behind. Think about what it was like when he first broke onto the scene. And people, a lot of people like Joker. He did funny impressions of Sharapova and other players. He picked the wedgie like Rafa when he did his impression of him serving. And then Djokovic stopped doing the impressions and got very serious and started beating Rafa everywhere. And uh, uh, fans, you know, people didn't like it all of a sudden. 
People were like, we liked you before you started beating uh, our heroes, Roger and Rafa. And now here we are all these years later, and when the story has been so laser-focused on Rafa taking the record away from Roger, Djokovic comes in and beats the King of Clay when he looks unbeatable. 2015, he looked terrible. He looked unbeatable. But I got to tell you, I know this is very different than 2015 from Rafa's perspective. And that, that might be everything we need to know. But never forget what happened in 2015. Could it literally happen again? They do both have one-handed backhands, of course. But one of them is a small kid who doesn't know how to fight. And your source is reliable. Sure. Well, if you want to refute something, great. Next question, please. I would like to answer that, please. So... Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Joe. K to the OV. I see you know your favorite player from the big three. I guess my mission is to be goat see. The only thing that can stop me is a throat heat. Fake ass next year, put them feet to the fire. I be the king of Australia, world number one for hire. Never eat the pasta, that's a part of my game. I got the gluten free diet, steady burning the flame. That's right, Joe. Not F E D, but similar to the letters. Rap up, can't do it better. Beat the king of clay, I beat the king of grass. Don't make movies with Shakira, give a fuck about Karnas. Nikirios, blow me, you fucking obnoxious. I beat your ass in Australia, do you dirty like pocket knockers. I love them too much. That's why I plan to win more because I love it so much. Come on, go. This is a coffee break tennis podcast. It is a podcast. I'm <laughs> choking on some decaf here, so excuse me. But uh, I had to get more use out of that. I put a lot of work into that hip hop extravaganza for Novak, and it, it, it is a good song. If ever you needed a rap diss track, I mean, this is the ultimate uh, diss from uh, Djokovic beating the King of Clay in his sandbox. And you know, I want to say a couple things about Djokovic because I know so many people hate Djokovic. He showed a lot of class on court after this was over. The first thing he said was that uh, what an honor and privilege, something to that effect, that it is to face Rafa. It's such a privilege for him to face Rafa here at Roland Garros and what it meant to him. And then later he said that, and you know, the, he's talking in French. He speaks great French. And uh, Guy Forget, forget you guy who once made us really mad about something he did to Roger years ago that I can't even remember now, but I started saying, forget you guys, that's what his name looks like if you uh, see it written. But it's pronounced Guy Forget because it's very French, and I can say anything I want making fun of French people because I am 15% French, Frank Reicher. Anyways, <clears throat> he was uh, speaking in French to Guy Forget, and then Guy Forget translates in English, and he says in French... Oh, God, I can't. Oh, what did he, I just blanked. What did he say? I remember now. He said that the pressure, he can't describe. He said it was indescribable, very difficult to describe, something like that. But he said, use the word describe and how hard it was to do so, describing the, the pressure you face against Rafa Nadal. It's so very difficult to play Rafa here in an atmosphere like that, knowing you're on the clay with the king. I mean, his legend at Roland Garros, it is the most impressive stat in all of sports, not just tennis. So what Djokovic did today is, you know, I love Roger Federer, and I, I think he's the greatest. But, whew, man, what what Djokovic did today is, is quintessential GOAT. Textbook definition of greatest of all time is what he just did to Rafa in his house playing that well. So... Guy Forget starts translating in English saying, uh, it is so difficult to describe the pressure that I felt playing Rafa today. This pressure is so intense. And then one of Djokovic's fans, they're holding a Serbian flag. They shout out, what pressure? And Djokovic laughs sarcastically like he's kind of annoyed by this uh, ignorant comment. And he says, what pressure? <laughs> and he calls out his own fan, right? A lot of people think Djokovic fans are obnoxious. And sometimes they are obnoxious. Maybe uh, maybe they should be obnoxious the way everyone uh, hates on Djokovic and cheers against him so much everywhere in the world practically. Man, they showed up today for him, though, didn't they? A lot of Djokovic fans in the crowd today. But Djokovic calls out his own fans, and he says, maybe that's what you tell... This is, he grabs the microphone, or he doesn't because it's on a stand. He Or maybe he did put it... It doesn't matter. He takes the microphone, and he says, maybe that's what you tell yourself, bro. He didn't say bro. But trust me. The pressure is real against Rafa Nadal. Djokovic called out his own fans. So the Djokovic haters, I hope you can give them 
a little bit of love and respect for doing the right thing there and uh and giving so much respect to Rafa in the uh, speech after the match was over. Uh don't forget that article I showed you o- earlier it said this is the end for Rafa when he loses the Djokovic in 2015. Uh it wasn't then and it's not now. I think Rafa can win another French Open. I think Roger can win another Wimbledon. Might happen in a few weeks. I think Djokovic can definitely win multiple more majors, and there's a good chance he ends up being the GOAT. But let's talk about how the match went down. And uh, I'll just say this about Sasha's. <laughs> this is what I did in the last video. And now we'll do uh, 30 seconds on Sitsipas and Sasha Zverev. Sitsipas was very good. He was impressive. Being up two sets to love and finding yourself in a fifth set is big time. And you could see how much it meant to Sitsipas. You know, he was uh, in tears. He's in his first final, like I, I was saying. Did I say this earlier? I don't remember. Uh, I guess I didn't say this. I haven't spent much time on Sitsipas. Sitsipas, this is his first time. So he's had the growing pains and the slip-ups and the mess-ups and the semifinals. Rafa's first final, he wins. Roger's first final, he wins. If Sitsipas is going to be one of the greats, and I think he could. I think Sitsipas could grab five, six majors, maybe maybe more. Definitely, he, he has the talent, and he seems to have the belief you know, he choked last year at the U.S. Open against Borna Chorch. Comes back down two sets to love at the Australian Open this year against Rafa. I think he's uh, showing that he can move past that and that he has what it takes mentally. And this was a tough mental match. Uh, Sasha Zverev, he had his chance in the fifth set. He was up 40 love early on the Sitsipas serve to break. And I'll say this. I tweeted something like this during the match. You know, choking or uh, not being mentally tough in the department of Sasha Vera, because he's got everything. He's got all the talent in the world. He's got a great serve. He's got a, one of the best backhands on tour. He's got a great forehand when it doesn't fall apart, when he gets nervous, gets very stiff and mechanical, deaccelerates, all that. You know, mental issues, he's got all the talent in the world, but the mental issues, it's not just the double faults that we see from Sasha Zverev, because that is his problem. It's mental. It's not just those random double faults. When the pressure comes on big, it's not just the forehand falling apart when the pressure comes on big. It's when he had the love 40 against Sitsipas early in the fifth, and he doesn't find that extra acceleration that you would see from a big three player where they just they go for the shot just a little bit more. They bring the pressure just a little bit harder. Instead, I mean, he doesn't play bad, but he backs off just enough to let Sitsipas have a chance. And once you do something like that and you get the confidence going, confidence is everything, especially in a fifth set of a major at a semifinal. That was a great semifinal, but it sucks compared to the one we just saw, which might have been the greatest semifinal of all time with Djokovic and Rafa. The only thing that compares is 2011 when Roger beats Novak Djokovic in a semifinal and, of course, wags the finger after one of the all-time uh, greatest moments ever for Fed fans. I mean, can you remember a more joyful day than that other than a 2017 Australian Open? All right, so let's look at how the match happened. Craig O'Shaughnessy, he used to be on the Djokovic team. He's a stats guru. If you don't know who he is, follow him on Twitter. He's great. 6-3, 3-6, 1-0, Nadal versus Djokovic. Rafa holds, but Djokovic steps into an ad court serve out wide and rips it cross to Rafa's serve plus one forehand, forcing the immediate error. This is a blueprint for Nole to do repeatedly for the rest of the match, and that he did. You know, Carlos Moya, you could see the evidence of what he's done for Rafa's game. There were some big moments where Rafa came up with an ace or just a serve that Djokovic didn't get back to keep the match alive because he changed his patterns. He used to serve ad out wide as a lefty all the time to where it was so predictable you could kind of sit there. But sometimes he surprises you now, more than he used to at least, and goes up the tee flat in the deuce court. Sometimes he hits it flat out wide instead of his up the tee with a little slice, lefty slice away. You can't get as much angle up the tee in the deuce court as a lefty, but you still can get some. He would hit that a lot. Now he's banging it out flat. And that just changes what it feels like as a returner. So this was the picture that uh, he included in his tweet. Djokovic stepping in. You can really see him out on the front foot, weight into the ball, hitting the ball way out early. Really, you know, you know that he's going to win this return nine times out of ten when you see that picture. And that's what it's like. You know, these guys, Roger and Rafa especially, Djokovic defends so well everywhere. But Roger and Rafa, they're very used to defending on the backhand side because their entire careers... Every player they go up against thinks, I have a great idea. Here's my game plan. I'm going to hit to his backhand because his forehand's the best forehand on tour. Federer and Nadal, they're both, they've always been up there as the two best forehands on tour. So I'm going to hit to the backhand over and over. Well, over the years, with the slices and, you know, also the topspin backhands they can hit, 
Roger and Rafa are so good at defending the backhand side from attack that they're actually better at defending. The forehand, they like to jump on things and attack or take a, a neutral ball from there. But when they really get pressured on the forehand side, yes, of course, they're going to come up with great shots occasionally, but they're just not quite as good defending on that side. And take a look at what it looks like when Rafa's having to play a forehand on pure defense. It's not as good, obviously. So that was something that Djokovic did very well. I mean, the returning, I talked about in the last show, Matteo Berrettini was a great warm-up for this because Berrettini's first serve is so big and his first forehand strike is so big. You know, Berrettini is one of the best serve plus one players out there. That's why he's a top 10 player. Uh, when uh, Djokovic was able to return the way he was to stop Berrettini from cleaning up with the forehand right away and get the rallies going, that was the best possible preparation to do what he had to do against Rafa because that's what you got to do. You know, um, if you can hit big to Rafa's backhand and push him back a little, and then you can really go big to his forehand corner and you, you can catch him like that to where the forehand is a very defensive forehand and he, he can drop it even shorter than what you might see on the backhand side just because there's so much use. Both him and Roger, there's so much more use to defending on that side. All right. Set all 6-3-3-6. Nadal versus Djokovic. Super smart approach by Djokovic. Take a look. Approaches right down the middle of the court to the Nadal backhand. An awesome play comes to the net. That's what approach means if you're very new to tennis. Uh, it's such an awesome play that it's completely underused at all levels. It provides no angle for the pass. How true is that? Djokovic did a lot of stuff like this. Very smart. Shorty D, Diego Schwartzman. You know, as I made yesterday's show, the more and more I talked about everything, the more I felt less confident in my pick of Rafa winning in five sets. I knew it was going to be a long, epic match. And the more I thought about it, by the time I finished that show, I kind of wished I had changed my prediction to Djokovic. Just because, you know, when you look at the stats department, he's serving so much better than Rafa. The way he returned against Berrettini, if he could do it again. And then also the way Shorty D, Diego Schwartzman, was able to trouble Rafa. Because he did a lot of the same stuff that we saw Djokovic do today. Djokovic did it much better. Executed at a higher level. And he had the serve to take advantage of the breaks. Shorty D couldn't hold to take advantage of the breaks. Djokovic could. I did say yesterday, if Shorty D had Djokovic's serve, he probably would have won against Rafa. So uh, there you go. That should have been everything we needed to know to, to think that Djokovic might win. All right, uh, let's see. I got, look at this really quick. They were going to kick all the fans out of what is probably the greatest semifinal of all time. And then this was the official announcement from uh, Emmanuel Macaroni. He parachuted in through the new roof and said, due to the exceptional nature of the match, public authorities will allow fans to stay. And uh, I just have to wonder if it was anyone else besides Djokovic and Nadal, maybe it was Federer and Nadal or Federer and Djokovic, would they have done this? I don't think so. I think it was because it was a goat match. They don't want to go down in history as the French government ruined it for the fans. And may, you know, maybe ruined the match. Maybe like... There's a long break getting the fans out of there, and, and like one of the guy's muscles go go cold, and the match has like a real stinker of a finish. So Mac Macaroni was like, no chance. Like I said, I'm you know, 15 or 10 percent French, something like that. I can make fun of the French all I want. Um, anyways, good on them. The French did it right here. All right, let's look at the serve plus one stats because I said this. A lot of talk about serve plus one. Djokovic was only ahead, 60 to 57, but that's that's huge. Because Djokovic, look, he beats him 53-39 in the 5-8 to eight, uh, shot rallies. And he beats him just barely, excuse me, 29-28 to 28 in the 9-plus shot rallies. So he didn't need much here. This is where, jo where Nadal cleans up. This is where Nadal would have a big advantage. If you look at last year's match, I don't have the numbers with me, but I remember doing the video last year. Nadal was way ahead in the 0-4 to four shot, the, the serve plus 1 type points. And, and I think... Um, Joke, maybe I can't remember what it broke down to the five to eight and the nine plus shots, but I think Djokovic might have been ahead, or at least it was very close. But Nadal had a big lead here, so you just had to take away that big lead. Even if this was uh, Nadal ahead by a little bit, Djokovic still wins this match. It didn't need to be a big lead for Djokovic here. He just needed to stop Nadal from getting a big lead in the zero to four shot rally. Uh, so this is kind of confusing looking, but take a look in the middle, and remember Djokovic is going to be on the left side and Rafa on the right of the net that runs down the middle. The first tier is serve. So everything here is showing us um, A would be aces, duh, and DF would be double faults from Nadal. So six aces mean that 
six times, Djokovic won on one shot only, zero to four shots, so one shot. Uh, zero would be a double fault. So eight double faults from uh, from Nadal. See, it says DF Nadal's there. So when we're looking at serve, this is how points broke down when they finished with just one serve being struck. Uh, they're tied in aces, I guess. Uh, oh, only one service winner over here. You see the W with a one. That means Nadal hit a serve that wasn't an ace, but Djokovic couldn't get it back. So I guess Nadal didn't have... Um, I guess there was no service winners for Djokovic. Is that possible? I don't know. Three double faults from Djokovic. So Nadal wins a combined 10 points from serve alone. Six aces, three double faults when Djokovic was hitting a serve. That's a zero-shot rally. And Djokovic wins 14, eight double faults from Nadal. A lot. That's eight double faults from Nadal and only three from Djokovic. That tells you how well Djokovic was returning serve. Nadal felt so much pressure that uh, there were some double faults. It was inevitable. All right, return. This means it's a two-shot rally. Uh, one time, Djokovic hit a winner off the return, I guess is how that reads there. It's a little confusing even for me, but bear with me. We're going to try to understand this together. Uh, six times, Djokovic's return was so good that it forced an error out of Nadal. And three times, uh, Djokovic missed missed the return. So I guess, wh why are those not service winners? I guess so, because they're unforced errors. From, oh, excuse me, that's from Nadal, though. It says three times Nadal made an unforced error after Djokovic hit a return. That's how that plays out. We look at the right side of the screen. Two times Nadal had a winning return. Eleven times he had a return that forced an error out of Djokovic. And two times he had a return that led to an unforced error from Djokovic. I guess. I'm not 100% sure on this now. It's confusing the, the crap out of me. But here's the all-important third shot. Djokovic... Had seven winners and three forced errors. That makes him 10 uh, on the third shot. Nadal, 11 winners and one forced error. That gets him 12. So on the serve plus one, it looks like he's slightly ahead here. Uh, 11 unforced errors where, uh, okay, so a lot of points there. Nadal with uh, seven unforced errors. I'm getting so confusing. I know some people are like, all right, click. I'm done with this video. <laughs> but like I said, I've never looked at this graph before, so let's try to try to make sense of it. And then the fourth shot. Uh, three winners from Djokovic, six errors from Nadal, forced by Djokovic, 10 unforced. So that would be uh, 19 altogether for the Joker. And then, uh, so it looks like the fourth shot is where Nadal was uh, not as good. Am I reading this right? If, if Nadal is serving, the return would be Joker's, the third shot would be his, the fourth shot would not be his. So does this mean fourth shot when he's returning? That must mean we got to flip it around when we look at this fourth shot. On the left side, it's Djokovic returning three times. On the fourth shot, he was able, because right, Nadal serves. Djokovic return is the second. Nadal hits his serve plus one all-important third ball. And remember, number five is where uh, Nadal does a lot of damage as well. Djokovic able to hit winners three times off of that serve plus one shot from Rafa. Six times, he's able to force an error, and ten times... Uh, he's able to hit a shot that's good enough to get an unforced error on ball number five from Rafa. I guess that's how that reads. Uh, sorry if I bored you to death with trying to understand that. The bottom line for me is 60 to 57. If Nadal wins this match, he has a big lead in this department. He's not behind by three. Okay, uh, hit the music because we're going to get out of here. I got a couple things for you. One, I told you the Peacock's going to be annoying everyone. That's how, That's their business model. Here's an email from the Peacock I got. They're like, hey, check it out. There's Rafa, the French Open final. We got it exclusive on the Peacock. Read below. Don't miss the final matches, starting with men's doubles. Oh, I don't know if they have. They only have doubles. That's what they have exclusively, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then what do you know? Oh, I'm on Instagram, and Peacock TV has got sponsored advertising on Instagram targeting me. Stream exclusive French Open coverage going to June 13th. I don't know. Maybe they'll have the final, too. I'm not sure. I'm not a big fan of the Peacock. Last thing. Federer's main goal for Hala. This is thanks to uh, Laura on Twitter. She uh, finds these articles. These are German articles, Westphalia. This is what Federer is saying right now. And this is why I think the people who get mad at him are stupid. Because he did the right thing for Wimbledon. Tennis star Roger Federer has taken a four-day break from training after his retirement from the French Open. See, he needed it. He couldn't go back out there and play. He knew what was up. They had to rest that knee for four days. He just started practicing in Germany yesterday for on the grass. His knee needed recovery, said the Swiss on Friday at a video press conference. He only briefly trained on grass for the first time on Thursday, right? Four days of rest plus a very light practice. Think about that. 
I'm optimistic that I'll feel okay for the next few days, said Roger. At the French Open in Paris, Roger withdrew from the tournament after a third round victory over Dominic Kepfer from the Black Forest. Uh, I don't know what that means. That must be a weird, um, it, it probably means Roland Garros, but it was a, a weird translation. Again, this is a German translated to English. Who knows what it really meant. He was no longer running for the round of 16. Federer just returned to tennis after blah, blah, blah. We know that. The focus of the Grand Slam tournament winner is on the upcoming grass. And Hala, the world number one, said, It starts with some uncertainty. I'm curious to see what I have in myself. I have a good feeling. I don't know whether the number one goal is to win this tournament, though. The main goal is to get to Wimbledon healthy. I haven't played enough to lean out the window and say that victory is only for me. That's a weird uh, translation. So anyways, I told you guys. Roger knows his only chance to win another is at Wimbledon, and he had to get out of there before he did any damage to the knee, and there's some proof the guy had to rest for four days. Uh, maybe I'll throw something together tomorrow just to talk a little bit more about the djokovic Tsitsipas matchup, more of a traditional preview. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to do that tomorrow, but we will definitely see you after the c conclusion, the conclusion of Roland Garros. Will Djokovic be the greatest of all time. Well, we might know a lot, a lot of that answer, a big part of it on Sunday. See you!